Book of Heaven, Volume 25, Part 10 March 22nd, 1929 In His Works, God Makes Use of Human Means How, in creation, the divine will had the field of action, constituting itself life of everything. How the divinity acts only as concurrent and spectator. I feel my poor mind as though fixed in the divine volition, and I was thinking to myself, how can his kingdom ever come upon earth? And besides, how can it come if it is not known? But while I was thinking about this, my always lovable Jesus, coming out of my interior, told me, My daughter, in my works, I make use of human means, though I do the first part, the foundation, and all the substance of the work that I want to do. And then I make use of creatures so that my work may be known and have life in the midst of creatures. So I did in redemption. I made use of the apostles in order to make it known, to propagate it, and to receive and give the fruits of redemption. And if the apostles had not wanted to say anything of what I said and did in coming upon earth, and closed in their muteness, had taken not one step, nor made one sacrifice, nor laid down their lives in order to make known the great good of my coming upon earth, they would have caused my redemption to die upon its rising, and the generations would have remained without the gospel, the sacraments, and all the goods that my redemption did and will do. This was my purpose, as in the last years of my life down here, I called the apostles around me to make use of them as the proclaimers of what I had done and said. Oh, if the apostles had remained silent, they would have been responsible for the loss of so many souls if they had not known the good of redemption. Responsible for so much good not done by creatures. But because they did not remain silent and they laid down their lives, they can be called after me, authors and cause of so many souls being saved, and of all the goods that have been done in my church, forming as the first proclaimers her unshakable pillars. It is our usual divine way that first we do our first act in our works. We place everything that is needed, and then we entrust them to creatures, giving them sufficient graces so that they may continue what we have done. And therefore our works become known according to the interest and the goodwill that creatures have. So it will be with the kingdom of my divine will. I called you as a second mother of mine, and one on one, just as I did with her in the kingdom of redemption. I manifested to you the many secrets of my divine fiat, the great good of it, and how it wants to come to reign upon earth. I can say that I have done everything, and if I called my minister so that you might open yourself in order to make it known, my intent was so that he would have interest in making known a good so great. And if this interest were not there on the part of those who should occupy themselves with it, they would put the kingdom of my will at risk of dying upon its rising, becoming themselves responsible 
for all the good that a kingdom so holy can bring. Or they would deserve that putting them aside. I call others as proclaimers and propagators of the knowledges of my divine fiat. Until I find some who have interest and take to heart making known its knowledges more than if it were their own lives. The kingdom of my will can have neither its beginning nor its life upon earth. After this, I continued my abandonment in the divine fiat, and my highest good, Jesus, added. My daughter, in creation, it was my divine will that had its field of action, and although our divinity was concurrent, because we are inseparable from it, however, the prime act, the action, was all of our will. It spoke and it operated. It spoke, and it ordered. We were the spectators of what our supreme volition was doing, with such great mastery, order, and harmony, that we felt worthily glorified and made twice as happy by our very will. Therefore, since creation is its work, the whole strength of creation and all the goods with which it was enriched are all in my supreme will. It is primary life of everything, and this is why it loves creation so much, because it feels its very life in all created things, and its very life flows in them. So much so that in creating man, wanting to make greater display of its power, of its love, and of its mastery. It wanted to enclose in him all the art of the whole creation. Not only this, but it wanted to surpass it, giving him such brushstrokes of divine art as to make him the little god, and laying itself inside and outside of him, to the right and to the left, above his head and under his feet. I carried him within my divine will as the outpouring of our love and as the triumpher and admirer of its insuperable mastery. Therefore, it was the right of my divine fiat that man live only and always of divine will. What had it not done for him? It called him from nothing. It formed him. It gave him his being, and it gave him double life. The life of man and that of my divine will, in order to carry him always clasped in its creative arms so as to preserve him beautiful, fresh, happy, just as it had created him. So, when man sinned, my fiat felt itself being snatched of that life that it carried in its very womb. What was not its sorrow? It remained with the void in its womb of this son, for whom, with so much love, so as to keep him safe and happy, it had made room within its very life. And do you think that in redemption it was not my very divine will that incarnated itself in order to come to find the lost man? It was precisely it, because verbum means word, and our word is the fiat that just as in creation it spoke and created, in the same way, in redemption, wanted and incarnated itself. It was its empty womb that claimed this child, who with so much cruelty had torn himself away. 
And what did this will of mine not do in redemption? But it is not yet content with what I did. It wants to fill its womb. It no longer wants to see man disfigured by sin, by dissimilarity from it. But it wants to see him adorned by the insignia of creation, adorned with its beauty and sanctity, and taking his place once again inside its divine womb. The Fiat Voluntas Tua, on earth as it is in heaven, is precisely this, that man return into my divine will. And only when it sees again its child happy, living in its house, with the opulence of its goods, then will it calm itself. And so it will be able to say, My child has come back. He is clothed with his royal garments. He wears the crown of king. He lives together with me. And I have given back to him the rights that I gave him in creating him. So the disorder in creation is ended because man has come back into my divine will. March 25th, 1929 How the Creation Runs a Vertiginous Race Towards Its Creator One who lives in the divine will is inseparable from it. Order that Jesus has kept in manifesting the truths about the divine will. Renewal of the Creation Importance of the Truths My abandonment in the divine fiat continues. I felt the littleness of my poor soul in the midst of all created things. And I as though having my own motion, my continuous race in all creation, feel inseparable from it. My will and that of creation are one, which is the sole and only divine will. Therefore, since the will of all is one, we do one same thing. And we all run as though to our first center, to our Creator, to say to Him, Your love issued us, and your same love calls us back into yourself, with a vertiginous race, to say to you, We love you, we love you, to sing the praises of your inextinguishable and interminable love. And so in this way, coming out of his center again, to continue our race that never makes stops, we do nothing but go in and out of his divine womb in order to form our round of love, our loving race toward our Creator. And so while I was running with the whole creation, to form my race of love toward the Divine Majesty, my always lovable Jesus, coming out of my interior, told me, My daughter, one who lives in my divine volition, is bound to all creation. Neither can creation do without this fortunate creature, nor can the creature unbind herself from the created things, because the will of one and the other being one, which is my divine will, they form one single body with many members inseparable from one another. So I look at one who lives in my divine will, and I see her heavens. 
I return to look at her, and I see her son. My gazes, enraptured by so much beauty, fix more upon her and find her see. In sum, I see in her all the varieties of each created thing, and I say, O power of my divine fiat, how beautiful you render for me, she who lives in you. You give her primacy over the whole creation. You give her the race, so fast, that she runs more than wind. And excelling over everything, she is the first to enter into my divine center to say to me, I love you, I glorify you, I adore you. And as she forms her echo in the whole creation, all repeat after her, her pleasant refrains. My daughter, this is why I take so much love in manifesting to you all that regards my divine will. Everything I have manifested to you about it is nothing other than the whole order of its kingdom. And all this was to be manifested from the beginning of creation, if Adam had not sinned. Because in each manifestation of mine regarding my divine fiat, man was to grow in the sanctity and beauty of his creator. And therefore, I intended to do it little by little, giving him as though many sips of divine life, to make him grow according to how my divine will wanted. So by sinning, man interrupted my speaking and reduced me to silence. After many centuries, wanting man to return into my fiat, I have resumed my speaking with so much love more than a tender mother when she loves and yearns to give birth to her child in order to kiss him, surround him with affections, enjoy him, and squeeze him tightly to her maternal breast, and to fill him with all her goods and happinesses. So I did in resuming my speaking and manifesting to you all the order of the kingdom of my divine volition, and the way that the creature must have in my kingdom. Therefore manifesting to you so many truths about my fiat has been nothing less than issuing into the field again all the order and love that I would have kept if man had not sinned and my kingdom had had its life upon earth. In my speaking, I have kept such order that one truth is so bound to the other that if anyone wanted to snatch away or conceal some truths, they would form a void in the kingdom of my divine fiat and would subtract a strength from creatures to induce them to live in my kingdom. In fact, each truth that regards my divine volition is a place that it takes in order to reign in the midst of creatures, as well as a way and an empty space that they find in order to take possession of them. Therefore, all the truths I have told you have such a connection among themselves that by removing some, in that point, one would see as though a heaven without stars, or a void without sun, or an earth without flowering. In fact, in all these truths that I have told you, there is the renewal of the whole creation. And in each truth, my fiat, more than sun, wants to come out into this field again just as it did in creation, and taking its field of action, with its light it wants to eclipse all the evils of creatures, 
and laying its veil of light over all. It wants to give them so much grace as to give them its creative hand to make them re-enter into the womb of its divine volition. Therefore, everything I have told you about my divine will has such importance that it costs me more than the whole creation because it is a renewal of it. And when an act is renewed, it costs double love. And in order to be more sure, we place double grace and double light to be given to creatures so that we might not have to suffer the second sorrow, maybe more painful than the first, that we had in the beginning of creation, when man sinned, conformed within himself the failure of our love, of our light, and of the precious inheritance of our supreme volition. This is why I am so attentive that you may lose nothing of what I tell you about my divine will, because there is such importance in these truths that in concealing some, it would be as if one wanted to move the sun from its place or to make the sea come out of its shore. What would happen to the earth? Think about it yourself. And so it would be if any of the truths about my divine will that I have manifested to you with so much order were missing. March 31st, 1929, Absolute Rights of the Divine Will How the Human Will Changed the Human Destiny and the Divine how, if man had not sinned, Jesus was to come upon earth, glorious, and with the scepter of command. Man was to be the bearer of his Creator. I feel within me the continuous power of the divine fiat that envelops me with such empire as to give no time to my dying will to do the slightest act, and it glories in not letting it die completely, because if it did so, it would lose its prestige of operating over a human will, that while it is alive, voluntarily receives the vital act of the divine fiat upon itself, and it is content with living while dying, so as to give life and absolute dominion to the supreme volition, that victorious with its divine rights, extends its boundaries and sings victory over the dying will of the creature, that though dying, smiles and feels happy and honored, that a divine will has its field of action within its soul. Now, while I was feeling myself under the empire of the divine fiat, my sweet Jesus, moving in my interior, told me, Little daughter of my divine will, you must know that these are absolute rights of my divine fiat, to have primacy over each act of the creature. And one who denies its primacy takes its divine rights away from it, that are due to it by justice, because it is the creator of the human will. Who can tell you, my daughter, how much evil a creature can do when she reaches the point of withdrawing from the will of her creator? See, one act of the first man withdrawing from our divine will was enough reaching the point of changing the destiny of the human generations. Not only this, but the very destiny of our divine will. If Adam had not sinned, the Eternal Word, who is the very will of the Celestial Father, 
was to come upon earth glorious, triumphant, and dominator, accompanied visibly by his angelic army, that all were to see. And with the splendor of his glory, he was to charm every one, and draw every one to himself with his beauty. Crowned as king, and with the scepter of command, so as to be king and head of the human family, in such a way as to give creatures the great honor of being able to say, We have a king who is man and God. More so, since your Jesus was not coming from heaven to find man infirm, because had he not withdrawn from my divine will, no illnesses, either of soul or of body, were to exist. In fact, it was the human will that almost drowned the poor creature with pains. The divine fiat was untouchable by any pain, and so was man to be. Therefore, I was to come to find man happy, holy, and with the fullness of the goods with which I had created him. But because he wanted to do his will, he changed our destiny. And since it was decreed that I was to descend upon earth, and when the divinity decrees, no one can move it, I only changed the manner and the appearance. But I did descend, though under most humble guises, poor, with no apparatus of glory, suffering and crying, and loaded with all the miseries and pains of man. The human will made me come to find man unhappy, blind, deaf, and mute, full of all miseries. And I, in order to heal him, was to take them upon myself, and so as not to strike fear in them, I was to show myself as one of them, become their brother, and give them the medicines and the remedies that were needed. So the human will has the power to render man happy or unhappy, a saint or a sinner, healthy or sick. See, then, if the soul decides always, always to do my divine will and to live in it, she will change her destiny, and my divine will shall fling itself upon the creature. It shall make her its prey, and giving her the kiss of creation, it shall change appearance and manner. Clasping her to its bosom, it will say to her, Let us put everything aside. The first times of creation have come back for you and for me. Everything will be happiness between you and me. You will live in our house as our daughter, in the abundance of the goods of your Creator. Listen, my little newborn of my divine will. If man had not sinned, if he had not withdrawn from my divine will, I would have come upon earth. But do you know how? Full of majesty, as when I rose again from death. Even though I had my humanity, similar to that of man, united to the eternal word, how different was my resurrected humanity, glorified, clothed with light, not subject to either suffering or dying. I was the divine triumpher. On the other hand, before dying, though voluntarily, my humanity was subject to all pains. Even more, 
I was the man of sorrows. And since man had his eyes still dazzled by the human will, and therefore he was still infirm, few were the ones who saw me resurrected, and this served to confirm my resurrection. Then I ascended into heaven to give man the time to take the remedies and the medicines so that he might recover and dispose himself to know my divine will in order to live not of his will but of mine. And so I will be able to show myself full of majesty and of glory in the midst of the children of my kingdom. Therefore, the resurrection is the confirmation of the fiat voluntas tua on earth as it is in heaven. After such a long sorrow, suffered by my divine will for many centuries, of not having its kingdom upon earth and its absolute dominion, it was right that my humanity place its divine rights in safety and realize its original purpose and mine of forming its kingdom in the midst of creatures. Moreover, in order to further confirm for you how the human will changed its destiny and that of the divine will with regard to it, you must know that in the whole history of the world, two persons only have lived of divine will without ever doing their own. And these were the Sovereign Queen and myself. And the distance, the difference between us and the other creatures is infinite. So much so that not even our bodies were left on earth. They had served as royal palace for the divine fiat, and the divine fiat felt inseparable from our bodies, and therefore it claimed them, and with its ruling strength, it kidnapped our bodies together with our souls into its celestial fatherland. And why all this? The whole reason is that our human wills never had one act of life, but all the dominion and the field of action was of my divine will. Its power is infinite. Its love is insuperable. After this he kept silent and I felt I was swimming in the sea of the fiat. And oh, how many things I comprehended. And my sweet Jesus added, My daughter, by not doing my divine will, the creature casts confusion in the order that my divine majesty kept in the creation. She dishonors herself. She descends down below. She places herself at a distance from her creator. She loses the origin, the means, and the end of that divine life that with so much love was infused in her in the act of being created. We loved this man so much that we placed in him our divine will as origin of life. We wanted to feel enraptured by him. We wanted to feel in him our strength, our power, our happiness, and our same continuous echo. And who could ever allow us to feel and see all this if not our divine will by located in him. We wanted to see in man the bearer of his creator, who was to make him happy in time and eternity. Therefore, when he did not do our divine will, we felt 
vividly the great sorrow of our work disordered our echo ended our enrapturing strength that was to enrapture us to give him new surprises of happiness converted into weakness in some it turned upside down this is why we cannot tolerate such a disorder in our work and if i have spoken so much about my divine fiat the purpose is precisely this we want to place man in the order that he may return to the first steps of his creation and our will flowing within him as vital humor may form again our bearer our royal palace upon earth his happiness and ours april fourth nineteen twenty nine how the first who will live in the divine fiat will be like the yeast of the kingdom of the divine will my abandonment is in the holy volition that like powerful magnet draws me to itself to administer to me sip by sip its life its light its prodigious admirable and adorable knowledges so my mind was wandering within it and my sweet jesus moving in my interior told me my daughter the first who will do my divine will and will live in it will be like the yeast of its kingdom the many knowledges that i have manifested to you about my divine fiat will be like the flour for the bread that in finding the yeast becomes fermented as much flour as one puts in but the flour is not enough it takes the yeast and the water in order to form the true bread to nourish the human generations in the same way the yeast of the few who live in my divine volition is necessary to me as well as the multiplicity of the knowledges about it that will serve as the mass of light that will give all the goods that are needed in order to nourish and make happy all those who want to live in the kingdom of my divine will therefore do not worry if you are alone and few are those who know in part what regards my divine will as long as the little portion of the yeast is formed united to its knowledges the rest will come by itself after this i was following the acts of the divine fiat in the creation and while i was following its acts in the heavens in the sun, in the sea, in the wind. My sweet Jesus moving in my interior told me, My daughter, look, everything that serves the whole human family in a universal way is always one. On the other hand, the other things that do not serve in a universal way are multiple. The sky is one and it extends above the heads of all the sun is one and it serves as light for all the water is one and therefore it gives itself to all and even though it seems divided into many fonts seas wells however from whatever place it descends it possesses the one single force the earth is one, and it extends under the feet of all. And just as in the natural order of creation, so in the supernatural order. God is the universal being, and he is one. And because one is the God of all, he gives himself to all. He envelops all. He is everywhere. 
he does good to all, and is life of all. One is the Virgin, and therefore universal mother and queen of all. One is your Jesus, and therefore my redemption extends everywhere and in a universal way. Everything I did and suffered is at the disposal of all and of each one. One is the little newborn of my divine will, and therefore the whole entire universe will receive, in a universal way, all the goods of the manifestations and knowledges of my divine fiat, that like sacred deposit I have deposited in you, so that more than splendid sun it may shine its innumerable rays to illuminate the whole entire world. Therefore, everything I tell you contains the universal virtue that will give itself to all and will do good to all. So be attentive and always follow my divine will. May everything be for the glory of God and for the fulfillment of his fiat. Deo gratias. You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven, Volume 25. Fiat 2.0